when I was doing my last year of theological education, I was at the Episcopal Seminary that is attached to Yale University. And as you might guess, in a town that has an Episcopal Seminary, New Haven, Connecticut has many Episcopal churches. The one thing you could count on was wherever you went to church on Sunday, you would run into the people you had seen all week in your classes and everywhere else. And so being me, of course, I chose to go someplace else to go to church. I went out of town to avoid all of my colleagues. I went to a little town north of New Haven, went to a tiny little Episcopal church that was eccentric as tiny churches often are. I'm remembering that on All Saints Day one year, uh, the, the Sunday school was supposed to do some sort of All Saints pageant at the end of church after communion. And so when the time came, we were done with communion. We had said the, the post-communion prayer, and we needed time to get all this set up. So they had us sing, I sing a song of the saints of God. You may know this hymn from Sunday school and whenever else. <clears throat> we sang it all the way through once, and nothing happened. No Sunday school people arrived. So... The organist, having presence of mind, began again from the top, and we sang it all the way through a second time, and nothing happened. And we were getting ready to launch into it for the third time through when somebody finally had the presence of mind to walk from the church into the next room and collect the Sunday school and bring them over. We were spared the need once again to look for saints on trains and at tea and wherever else you're supposed to find them, according to the hymn. I think it's now burned into my memory so much I may never forget it and, uh, as much as I may try. But the kids actually did give us a good lesson in that moment about the saints and the work and the lives of the saints, that a lot of what goes on in the lives of saints happens off stage, and it happens according to a timetable that is not really ours to choose. That's really useful to bear in mind whenever we come to consider the life, the life and work of the saints because so little of it seems to make any sense any other way. The church has long since figured this out. No matter what year of the three in the cycle you come to church on All Saints Day, you will never hear a lesson read that really tells you anything about the saints. You'll notice that today the lessons we heard read are ones that are often read at funerals. I know this because I officiated a funeral on Friday. I celebrated the Mass for all the dead in the cemetery yesterday. Uh, these are meant to give comfort to people who are grieving. And if, in fact, today is a day when you are grieving for any reason, and that was all you needed to hear, the comfort of the presence of God, then take that and be blessed by it. But I want to suggest to you there's more to it than that. There's a reason why the church has chosen that we should hear about the acts of God on the Feast of All Saints rather than about the acts of saints. And that is because it is always about God, no matter what the story is, what God is doing in us and through us. And for that purpose, we do get some interesting lessons that paint a very vivid picture of what we ought to expect to see in the lives of the saints and indeed in the lives of all the faithful people, all the followers of Jesus. <clears throat> in the Old Testament, we have this image, wonderful image of, of, of a feast, rich food. This isn't Cheetos and Diet Mountain Dew. This is good food, more than we could ever ask for, more than we would ever want. There's abundance here, a word we've used a lot in this church recently, but here we see it once again right there in front of us in a way that we can all understand in the weeks leading up to Thanksgiving. There's also joy that somehow being in this, this peaceful place where whatever has been broken, whatever is wrong in the world, whatever has gone wrong in the world has been put right by God on God's holy mountain. So abundance and joy. Then in the New Testament lesson, we hear a piece of uh, the story from Revelation. I, as I confessed at 8 o'clock, I will confess again to you from the safety of this place that now every time, I having only just read and commented on Revelation a couple of months ago, every time it comes up in the lectionary, I'm tempted to turn the sermon into a lecture on what's going on in Revelation. I'm not going to do that today. But I will say that in this, we have a beautiful image of the presence of God in this perfected city coming down from heaven, this gift of God to God's faithful people. 
somehow to be in the presence of God, to be, to be perfected ourselves, is something that we may hope to desire in God's plan for the universe. And there's also renewal. Again, something is going to be changed. We will all be changed in some way. That which we know now will pass away and something purer, more beautiful will be renewed in its place. So the presence of God and renewal. <clears throat> and then in the gospel, this very iconic story, the raising of Lazarus, we hear first Jesus acting in a remarkable way. It, it, it's faith in action. When he says aloud, not for God's benefit or his, but for all the benefit of all the people standing around him, I know that you always hear me. Can you imagine being able to say that? In every one of your prayers, I know, dear God, that you always hear me. If we're honest with ourselves, dear friends, I'll bet there are a bunch of us who would say, no, I don't think I can quite say that. And yet we should. That's the promise God has already made to us. That which Jesus did, Jesus did we will do also. Faith in action. That He believes that deeply. And then this wonderful expression at the end, unbind him and let him go. Yesterday in his sermon, in his investiture as the new presiding bishop, Bishop Rowe talked about how in that moment, God is handing off the work to us. Jesus tells the other people, unbind him and let him go. There's empowerment in it, this idea of unbinding, of releasing what has been held back, releasing whatever has been prevented from becoming what it needs to, what it truly is intended to. And so here we see faith in action and unbinding in all of its many forms. So I commend those six things to you as you think about the lives of the saints, any saint, every saint, abundance and joy, the presence of God and renewal, faith in action and unbinding. We see all of those things happening in, in the nature of God. Somehow they're, they're more than God can contain. They spill out of the lives of the saints into the world. And indeed, they're meant to spill out of the lives of all of the faithful into the world. Because, dear friends, I say this every year on All Saints Day. You're probably, probably tired of hearing me say it by now, but I'll say it again. Sainthood is not about getting a gold watch. It's not a gold star for having behaved well. It's not having a speed dial to God so you can get whatever you want whenever you want it. Somehow it is about being faithful and recognizing in that moment that somehow the fullness of what God desires for the universe cannot be contained in your life, but must leak out of you and, and infect everyone around you, must come forth in such great quantity that no one can fail to notice who you are and whose you are. Nonetheless, it is still about what God does, and I want to suggest to you that there's, there are things we're hearing in these lessons that ought to tell us something about what that means and how that ought to look, even as we look at our own lives. <clears throat> the thing that all these lessons seem to share is somehow the idea of the defeat of death. That may sound like a slogan, and it, it is easy enough to say, well, how is that even possible? Having only just officiated at a funeral and at the Mass for all the dead yesterday, I can say, we know all the saints die. Everyone dies. Isn't it a little bit too easy to say, well, it's all about somehow death ending? I think there's more to it than just the literal death we imagine, the ending of this mortal life. Somehow there is something that God intends to continue in each one of us. It's that, I think, that has, is clearest in the lives of the saints and is worth reflecting on on this day in particular. So I have three of these qualities to suggest to you. The first is that a saint is, but a saint also does. We read in the letter of James that faith without works is dead. And yet, here again, I have to come back to what I said earlier and remind you, it's not about what saints do. 
There's nothing that St. Thomas ever did that made him a saint. There was nothing that St. Catherine of Siena or Dietrich Bonhoeffer or anybody else whom you admire, whom we admire for their Christian lives, who ever did anything that made them saints. It was only what God was doing in them. And yet somehow, whatever that was that God was doing impelled them. They were unable to sit still in whatever fashion was appropriate to their lives. They had to act on it. Think of St. Francis, who was many things, but he never had a peaceful life. He never stopped moving. He never stopped doing things. He was always somewhere else beginning something. He never really wanted to have power in this world. He did everything he could to avoid being the leader of the order that he started. And yet, the grace of God, the power of God was so great in him that he was unable to sit still. I wonder if you've ever been in a flood. Not the sort that happens in the basement when the freezer breaks, but the kind that happens out in nature when the river rises. I have. I've been in, in a town where it happens a lot. It's a powerful but very eerie thing because there's very little uh, commotion. I mean, there, there, there isn't a whole lot of, of storm and stress, but the water rises silently, and it will continue to rise. Nothing is going to stop it. It will go wherever it chooses to go. That, to me, is what that feeling of the power of God rising in us is like. Not dramatic, but completely unstoppable. I think also of St. Benedict and, and St. Scholastica. St. Benedict, whose faith drove him to form a little religious order where people could live a sort of perfect Christian life together, and then to write a set of suggestions about how that life ought to be conducted for the greatest sanctity of the greatest number of people, which comes right down to us today as the rule of St. Benedict. And St. Scholastica, his sister, who loved talking to her brother so much that she would do anything to keep him from leaving. The story is told that when she was near death, he came to visit her in the hut where she lived, and they talked all day into the evening, and he finally said, okay, it's time for me to go. She wasn't done with him yet. So she prayed to God for a thunderstorm, and it rained so hard all night that he was unable to leave, and he was compelled to stay there and talk with her for the rest of the night. Talk about determination, faith in action. And yet joy also, to find a fellow soul. Wherever two or three are gathered together, God is in the midst of them. That's a good start. It's a beautiful thing. You and I do the same. It will be worth it to remember that every little thing that we do done in faith is an action for the kingdom of God. Every time you notice that there's, there's a, we need another roll of toilet paper in the bathroom and you take it there. Every time you make cookies for Hope Dining Room, Every time you pick up trash on the front lawn of the church, whatever tiny thing it is, it counts. And God help us if we ever underestimate the value of the things that have been put into our hearts to do for the kingdom of God. So that's the first of the three. <clears throat> the second then takes that a step further. And that is to say that faith must always bring life. That also sounds like a total slogan, I know. But what I'm talking about here is not simply about existence. It's not just about life and the fact that we, we're upright and taking nourishment today. It's about dignity, wholeness, and soulment. Using everything that has been given to us to include that, that, that light of Christ that shines out of us to remind every other person we meet that the light of Christ is in them also that they are as much beloved children of God as anyone else. <clears throat> I think here of Constance and her companions, the Memphis Martyrs, a group of religious sisters who, along with physicians and clergy and a bunch of other people whom we don't even know, went to or were in Memphis, Tennessee in 1878 in one of the last big yellow fever outbreaks in the United States. Most of the people who had money or resources got out of town. So those who were left had to suffer on their own. But Constance and her, her friends and all those who were around her, who were not nursing sisters, bear in mind, they were, they were teachers, school teachers. 
did what they could to take care of those who were sick. They had no training. They had no resources. This is Memphis in 1878. No air conditioning, where they were probably no indoor plumbing, probably very little else that they could rely on for any help. Just whatever their ingenuity would come up with. And most of them died in the process. Constance is supposed to have been one of the first people in the group to die of yellow fever, and in the end, many of them did. But in the process of what they did, they brought dignity to those who otherwise would have died alone. They brought comfort to those who otherwise would have had none. They were able, by simple gestures, to bring dignity, to bring God's grace to people who desired it so deeply and would otherwise not have known of it. Mother Teresa is another good example of this. Someone who went to a poor part of the world with very little in the way of resources, who worked with other poor people to bring care to yet more poor people. She was criticized in her life and has been since for not having tried to bring higher technology into what it was she was doing. But I think the people who complain about that missed the point. The point was to bring dignity to people, to, to bring one soul to another. And in that, she, she succeeded beyond anyone's expectations. <clears throat> we do the same thing, every one of us. Every time we give someone a ride to the doctor, every time we go visit somebody who is sick or in the hospital, every time we take somebody to coffee because we just notice they look like they're feeling down lately, every time we listen to someone else's story, we're bringing dignity and soulment to someone else. And make no mistake, dear friends, when we do that, we are in the presence of God and it is God who is blessing both of us in doing. And then the third, beyond even bringing life, whatever flows out of the saints, whatever flows out of the faithful must bring sanctification, must somehow bring God closer to the world and the world somehow closer to God. These are probably the most difficult examples because they can be so small and so hidden and yet are so important. Think of someone like Edith Stein, who is, was known in her religious life as St. Teresa of the Cross, I believe. <clears throat> she was a, a woman of Jewish ancestry living in Poland who was a famous philosopher who converted to Christianity, became a Catholic nun, and died at Auschwitz. Or someone like Oscar Romero, who was by rep reputation a fairly conservative Catholic church leader, became the bishop of San Salvador, recognized what was going on around him in, the, in El Salvador in the 1980s, began to speak against it, and was killed for his trouble while he was saying Mass. Or someone like Saint Therese de Lisieux, a, a French woman who lived a short and, and very unhealthy life. She was never able to do very much beyond what she desired most deeply, which was to become a nun and pray for those in ordained ministry. But in the last few years of her life, she was encouraged, prodded, to write her autobiography, her spiritual journey, which is one of the great classics of 20th century spirituality. She's regarded as one of the great saints of the last couple centuries. <clears throat> These people whom you may never even have heard of, who didn't do enormous things. They didn't write books. They didn't start orders. They, they, they didn't run countries. But even in their lives, however short, however long, and however sadly they may have ended, they were able to show the sanctification that comes from following what it is that God has put into our hearts. So, we give thanks for all the saints. We give thanks for this day when we remember the powerful acts of God. We give thanks this day for all those powerful acts we have seen in our own lives, not simply in the people in the windows. Day by day, the power of God, that, that abundance and joy of God, that, that unstoppable desire of God for presence with us, and for sanctification that spills out of every one of us if we will only let it. 
Thanks be to God for all of it. May it continue. May God be glorified in all of God's saints. Amen.